With the Kansas City Chiefs becoming the new juggernaut of the National Football League, more eyes are on them than ever. Super Bowl 54 cemented the Mahomes-era Chiefs as a success, bringing Kansas City their first Lombardi Trophy in 50 years. This first Chiefs victory, all the way back in Super Bowl IV, is most known for Hank Stram's legendary chatter on the sidelines. However, this 1969 Chiefs team is also known for its underrated defense, which was the only in the Super Bowl era to win it all without allowing double-digit points in a single postseason game. This defense needed to put in double the effort, as the offense had suffered major hits to the quarterback position. Hall of Famer Len Dawson, who was also alleged to have been part of a gambling ring, suffered a knee injury during a Week 2 blowout of the, at the time, Boston Patriots. The very next week, backup quarterback Jackie Lee went down with a broken ankle in one of the Chiefs' three losses on the year. Sophomore third stringer Mike Livingston helped to engineer a five-game winning streak with every other Chiefs quarterback out of commission. The end of the regular season was a bit of a coin flip, with Dawson coming back for a couple of games only to suffer another injury. Despite how unsure things may have seemed, the Chiefs pulled it together with Dawson under center and willed their way to a low-key dominant Super Bowl run. The astronomically complex quarterback situation may have been aided by the stellar offensive line, led by two linemen that very well could have been inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. The first is Ed Buddy, who was slighted due to what I can only assume is a big middle finger to players who were predominantly stars in the AFL. Buddy was a sure bet on the Chiefs, receiving his flowers in the Kansas City Chiefs Hall of Fame. The other is the 1969 AFL Offensive Lineman of the Year, the captain of that Super Bowl winning team, and the subject of one of the darkest stories in the NFL's history, Jim Tyra. James F. Lotyra, born on February 25, 1939, was seemingly born to play football. Listed at 6'6 six six and 280 pounds, he easily worked his way onto Ohio State University's football team. Not much is known about his tenure as a player under College Football Hall of Famer Woody Hayes. From the research I've done, he was not a part of the national championship teams in 1957 or 1961. Some evidence points to All-America honors, but the most I found for him was back-to-back All-Big Ten Conference teams in 1959 and 1960. He would end up being drafted in both the AFL and the NFL, with the NFL's Chicago Bears selecting him in the 14th round with pick number 188. In the four picks before this, Hall of Famers Billy Shaw and Deacon Jones were selected. As fate would have it, though, he would never go to Chicago. With pick 22 in the third round of the AFL draft, the Dallas Texans would select him as well. The choice between third round money and 14th round money was an obvious one, and he signed on the dotted line with the Texans. He joined in only the second season of the team and the league's existence, and saw them rise to football's Mount Everest within a decade of his 13-year stay. In 1962, his sophomore season, he notched his first AFL All-Star honors and helped the Texans win their first of three AFL championships that would be won under his watch. By 1963, the Dallas Texans had relocated to Kansas City and officially became the Chiefs. They would win the AFL championship in 1966, earning the right to be one half of the very first Super Bowl. In the first half against the Packers, the Chiefs appeared to be making it a contest. They outgained the Packers 181 yards to 164, and managed to keep the score close at 14 to 10. However, the second half blew the game wide open for the Packers, who took home the very first Lombardi Trophy. This defeat was crushing for the young Chiefs, but they would take this as motivation and turn it into something greater. After the Jets' victory in Super Bowl III the previous year, the media and the fans could finally believe that an AFL team can hang with the more seasoned and established NFL teams. This would only be reinforced with the Chiefs' emphatic 23-7 Super Bowl IV victory over the Minnesota Vikings, 
who would unfortunately never recover from their Super Bowl loss in the same way as the Chiefs did. Tyrer, by 1969, had achieved seven AFL All-Star nods along with three AFL championships, a Super Bowl, nine All-AFL teams, his first Pro Bowl nod, and a nomination as a member of the all-time AFL team. Keep in mind that the American Football League bred exceptional offensive linemen, such as Hall of Famers Ron Mix, Jim Otto, Billy Shaw, Winston Hill, and Gene Upshaw. These all-time great linemen who were the gold standard of blocking at the time were not examples for Tyrer. They were his peers, and according to some, they weren't even on his level. Hall of Fame defensive lineman Elvin Bethea says that all other blockers were mediocre compared to Jim Tyrer in his prime. The Chiefs would unfortunately never be back to the Super Bowl with Jim Tyrer on the team. As the AFL merged with the NFL, Tyrer found himself on the tail end of his career. He would make the Pro Bowl in 1970 and 1971. In 1971, he was a part of the Kansas City sweep of the Pro Bowl, in which both the offensive and defensive MVPs of the game were from the Kansas City Chiefs. Those two being Jan Stenerud, an all-time great kicker, and Willie Lanier, a legendary linebacker known for his unique helmet and play style. By 1972, it was clear that Tyra was starting to decline quickly. And as a testament to his value, in August of 1974, the Chiefs traded him to the at-the-time Washington Redskins for three draft picks. He played one season with them before announcing his retirement at the same press conference as his former trench mate and fellow Super Bowl champion, Dave Hill. In 1977, he was honored by the Kansas City Chiefs by being inducted in their team Hall of Fame. All that was left now was to wait another three years to make it into the Pro Football Hall of Fame and be immortalized in Canton, Ohio until the end of time. This is where we truly go downhill, so please prepare yourselves. It is said that he would struggle with serious head pain at times during his career and after his football retirement. Some of this can be attributed to his size. As a six foot six, nearly 300 pound behemoth by the standards of the 60s and 70s, he also had one of the largest heads in the league. So large, in fact, that it is said that extra padding and protection had to be removed from helmets in order to fit him. One of Tyra's children inspected his helmets long after his career was over, and the padding found was described as not even a half inch thick. Most outer shells would be way too small and press on his head. Defensive end Ben Davidson, best remembered for his admittedly dirty play with the Oakland Raiders, compared Tyra's helmet to a big red trash can. In the beginning stages of the AFL, linemen were actually not permitted to block with their hands, incentivizing the use of their heads as battering rams. And nobody was better at ramming their head into people than Jim Tyra throughout his 14-year career that saw him play in 194 games and start in 179 of them, not to mention nine playoff games with eight of them being starts. While it was never confirmed nor denied, we can be more than certain that this had a factor in everything that happened after his days as a warrior on the gridiron came to a close. Tyra would struggle to find work after his retirement and was offered a scouting job with the Chiefs. It is said that he made around $80,000 a year during his time as a player, and the scouting job for the Chiefs only offered around $25,000. He would spend the next three years as a salesman, but eventually the traveling became too much for him. He took a good portion of money and invested in a tire business, which would ultimately prove to be a massive financial mistake. The mild winter took this business prospect and completely shut it down, forcing him to go work at Amway. The ever-growing series of unfortunate business failures combined with the near certainty that he had severe brain damage akin to CTE came to a head in one of the most shocking chapters in the Chiefs' history, as well as football as a whole. On September 14, 1980, Jim Tyrer and his youngest son Jason were attending a Chiefs game as they took on the Dolphins at Arrowhead Stadium. 
It's not unusual by any stretch to see greats of the local pro team going to watch games, but something about this one would seem off with some people. Later accounts would describe Tyrer as being oddly transfixed by the action. He spent most of the game just staring blankly at the field, as if he wasn't all there. Jason himself would later note that his father was more affectionate than usual when the game rolled around. He's quoted as saying, He didn't hug us a lot, but that game he did. I got this kind of, it felt unusual, you know? At 9pm that night, Jim got home and spoke to his eldest son, Brad. Brad noted that the conversation felt like his father knew he would never see him again. Jim told his son how proud he was of him and to take care of his brother and sisters. Brad noted how out of the blue it seemed, and the out of left field conversation only lasted around 20 minutes. After it was over, Brad had a feeling that he knew, his father knew, he was about to do something horrific. And in the early hours of the next day, September 15th, 1980, Jim Tyrer would take his gun and take the lives of both himself and his wife, Martha. The tragedy rocked Kansas City to its core. Most that knew Jim and the Tyrer family were shocked beyond belief. Len Dawson, longtime Chiefs teammate and friend of Tyrer, told the Associated Press he was always such a strong, stable guy. He was a great family man. Doing something like this is completely contrary to his character. Though nothing seemed too off-putting, near the end of his life, Jim would seem to be more and more dejected with his position in the world. He felt like he was on top of the world when he was playing football, making big money while being one of the best in the game. But when the lights were off and the game had passed him by, he just couldn't seem to pull it all the way together. By the time of the incident, it was said that he was in debt, with some figures being as high as hundreds of thousands of dollars. No matter the circumstances, his actions will never truly be acceptable. Leaving behind four children and taking away both of their parents at the same time is something that I don't know if I can personally forgive and it seems like the Pro Football Hall of Fame thinks the same way as I do. His legacy in the game of football simply cannot be mentioned without also acknowledging how his life came to such a tragic and early demise. And, said legacy could have been one of the greatest of all time to suit up in the trenches. There are only 21 offensive linemen that have ever made First Team All-Pro five times and the Pro Bowl seven times. Out of those 21, the only one to not make the Hall of Fame is Jim Tyra. However, a legacy is not defined by what you did in whatever sport you played or whatever Hall of Fame you made it into or were kept out of. A legacy is how you are remembered by those who knew you and those who still think of you and speak of you. Filmmaker Kevin Patrick Allen has worked hard to produce short films that explore the life of the Tyra family and pays great respect to the surviving children as well as the tragedy while bringing everything to light. Please check out the link below to the film collaborative for more information and check my sources in the description if you wish to read more on your own time. Thank you so much for watching this video. I'm not sure how y'all feel about me doing this style of content, but I figured I would give it a try. Please like, drop a sub, and tell me in the comments what athletes, players, or people you think are Hall of Fame worthy, but didn't, or will not, for some reason, get the nod.